Woo! Glory. This day was worth trudging through to get here. <laughs> That's all I can say. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Just tell him thanks again. And God, we're grateful, and we just say we want more. We want more of you. We want more of your kingdom. We want more of your righteousness. We want to have a clearer hearing ear to know you as we've never known you before and to make you known for all the world to see and know that there is a true and living God who sent forth Jesus that we might be born again into your family made into kings and priests for your glory, to rule and reign in righteousness on earth, even as it is in heaven. We give you thanks and praise and glory. Amen. Wow. I'm going to try to bring this message. <laughs> I will try. Wow. Wow. Um. Just a couple of announcements. We will meet Tuesday night for um, our Advancing Faith class. It's at 7 o'clock. Uh, we'll meet in here. Um, I will start the class off, and then I'm going to hand it off to Sandra because I have an assignment at 8 o'clock um, to share with the business network on First Fruits. So I'm asking you to pray for me. And, um, yes, we will be teaching that here in the coming weeks. So um, just, you know, that's why we have team here. It doesn't have to be me doing it all, thank God. It's an awesome thing. Um, and then we will obviously be back next Sunday night. Um, is there anything else I am missing? Report on Richard Vogan. He is home from the hospital and doing well, improving. Continue to pray for his strength to improve. For those who don't know, he had a uh, quadruple bap bypass a week ago Friday. So I think that's right. I keep losing track of what, what day are we on? Monday. This past Monday he had it. Yeah. So it's been just about a week, but he is home and um, gaining strength every day. So um, pray for them. Uh, Rick and Teresa are, you know, they have been out since COVID hit in October in our, in this house. And uh, been taking their time getting their strength back, particularly Teresa. But uh, I was able to have dinner with them on Thursday night and um, had a great time. They have now gone to visit with their daughter and son-in-law and grandkids because they have not been able to see them throughout all the holidays. So they're gone for a couple of weeks. So pray for them for travel mercies and just to be reconnected with family in a, a great and uh, positive and fruitful way there's nothing quite like being with your grandkids you know if you could bypass having kids and just have grandkids but <laughs> it's a part of the pathway no I love my kids but I do love my grandkids I'll just say um, so God is moving us forward uh, I know many of you join us on the 222 prayer calls every day and on the Tuesday night at 9 p.m. We are shifting the 222 calls to only be Monday through Friday. Now that we're all beginning to get a little bit more active on the weekends, ministries are going on in other places, uh, having a team to carry the call on every day at 222 gets a bit stretching at times. Um, it's powerful, but we just felt like the Lord said it's time to shift, keep them going, because they're incredibly strengthening for all of us. I know they're strengthening for us on the call. And I hear lots of testimonies from people about how it's ministering to them. So um, keep joining us every day. It's important that we pray for righteousness to be established in this nation. And that the church be awakened and brought into a greater measure of maturity in all things. Because some of what's going on right now is there's a lot of division in the church. There's a lot of 
conflict and a lot of uh, just mess. And I don't want to go into a lot of that, and yet it is a setup for my message. I've got a lot of boom in my mic. If y'all can adjust some of that, maybe bring it down a bit. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but it's bouncing me. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're living in a time and a season where over the last decades, I'm going to stretch this out, okay? Over decades, we have seen um, ministers and entire denominations depart from truth. We've seen embracing of uh, ideologies, lifestyle practices, um, stances. I mean, that people get into an argument over abortion being something that Christians should embrace or not. I mean, really? I mean, it's life. Life comes from God. Who are we to take it away to the most vulnerable in the womb? And yet we have entire denominations that are saying it's a woman's right. I want to say, what about the right of that baby? We have entire denominations that are embracing the LGBTQ whatever. And saying, it's okay, that's the way they were born. No, they're not. That is the product of sin. And there are men and women of God who won't stand in a pulpit and say that. I determined a long time ago, if God called me th to this, then I had to be true to what he said. And if we've got a couple of people in here or we're packed out, it does not matter to me. I have to be true to what God says. We've got so many things going on in our nation right now. And a call for people to walk in unity that isn't unity. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? I cannot walk in unity with somebody that is going to promote, embrace, and tell me my tax dollars have to help pay for an abortion. I can't walk with that. I can't walk in agreement with something that says, let the boys, if they think they're a girl, go into the girl's restroom. I will never stand for that, and I will not be silent. I will not stand by and let my grandchildren go to school in a place and don't think it's just because it's public or not. I'm telling you, it's everywhere. That won't stand on truth. I won't stand and be silent for doctrines of demons ruling the church and influencing government. Because quite honestly, if the church would be who we're supposed to be, we would not be in the mess we're in. And I'm not just talking about this election. This is just the latest step in a long trajectory in the wrong direction. So since it's 555 and triple grace, I'm going to go to my passage. <laughs> For nearly 20 years, and that was on the heels of 10 years of praying Ezekiel 44, I've been teaching on the priest, the sons of Zadok. Long before it became a popular title of a book, the first time I preached this message, I was in Norway. My pastor at the time looked at me and said, where did you get that revelation? I said, well, I've been praying it over my own life for 10 years, and for about the last eight, I've been praying it over you. And that was not to accuse him in any way. It was just I knew that God said, I have got to have some men and women in this coming hour and in this hour that are sons of Zadok 
that will not bow their knee. The passage is sobering, it's inspiring, it's challenging, and it's definitely one that calls for a response. You cannot read, really read, Ezekiel 44 and not respond. I'm going to start in verse 10. And I encourage you, go read the entire thing. I'm not going to read all of it because it would take too long and it's not necessary for the purpose that I'm bringing tonight. It starts in verse 10. But the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who went astray from me following their idols, shall suffer the punishment for their wrongdoing. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having oversight at the gates of the house and ministering in the house. They shall slaughter the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister to them. Isn't that amazing? That God says they went astray, but they're gonna, I'm, I'm going to still let them do the work. Verse 12, since they ministered to them, the people, before their idols and became a stumbling block of wrongdoing to the house of Israel, for that reason I have sworn against them, declares the Lord God, that they shall suffer the punishment for their wrongdoing. And they shall not approach me to serve as priest for me, nor approach any of my holy things to the things that are the most holy, but they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. Nevertheless, I will appoint them to take responsibility for the house of all of its service and everything that shall be done of it. For me, this is absolutely one of the most grievous passages in all of Scripture. Can you imagine being called to minister to the Lord and to serve in his house? And yet, because you allowed the influence of culture to take you off course... And to compromise the message of truth that God says, you're going to get to keep doing all the work. You're going to keep tending to all the stuff. But you're not allowed to come to me. That puts the fear of God in me. Because to try to do this without being able to come near to him, there's nothing more grievous, nothing that would be more difficult, impossible. And yet, we have countless that are doing it. Because God cannot in his holiness allow unrighteousness to come into his presence and to abide there. He can't do it. Because sin and righteousness cannot coexist. And God who is holy cannot even look upon sin. So how could he allow someone to come and minister to him if they're Teaching the people that abortion is okay. They can't do it. But here's the deal. You can so learn how to do what we do that you can do it by just knowing what to do. I mean, it, <laughs> that's staggering to think about, but it is the reality you can be such a student and have such a knowledge of the word that you can put together a good sermon and probably put it together far better than I do because I don't worry about putting it together well. My concern is that I'm hearing what he's saying 
and releasing it. I told Sondra when I came in today, I said, well, my notes are all over the place. But I know where God wants to go. See, when they go astray, when the people go astray, they followed after the idols. And they didn't just become the people's idols, they became their idols. What are some of the idols today? Can I start with one that's probably going to step on some toes? Protecting your following. Not saying the hard things because you might offend somebody and they will leave. It's an idol. Success can be an idol. Money is an idol. It's not always money. If you see money as a tool, it's not an idol. If you see it as something that you're afraid of losing and you're using it for your influence so that you got, might get what you want, then it's shifted to an idol. See, we need to take a look at what are the idols that could ensnare us. That's part of why I believe it was so important tonight we break the chains off. Because our comfort zones can be idols. Our personal preferences can be idols. Status quo mediocrity, so so everybody thinks you're okay, can be an idol. Keeping peace with everybody around you can be an idol. Now, there's a wisdom of knowing how to walk through that. But you can't depart from truth in order, as I've been saying the last few weeks, go along to get along. I'm not going to go along with the devil. So we've got to get rid of the idols. But then God says they'll suffer. Now, I'm not going to define what the suffering looks like. I know what it would look like for me. Just not being in his presence is enough suffering for me to go, i got to get back. Can't live without him. But I'm not going to say there's not other kinds of sufferings that can come. The word that is used in that passage, yet you shall be servants or shall minister, actually can mean menial task. Just doing the menial, just doing the routine. But what about this, of becoming a stumbling block to others? Do we not see this? Of seeing people that are in leaders that have embraced doctrines of demons, because that's what it is. And others go, well, they teach the word so good. Yeah, but no. They're causing them to stumble, causing confusion to come in, even especially to the younger people people of our generation, of not teaching sound doctrine, of not teaching what the Word of God says on some of these issues, because we'll teach all around it. The priests that go astray will teach and dance all around it, but won't speak to the issue. Shall not approach the Lord. Wow. Every time I read that, I tremble. And it says they shall bear their shame and their abominations or their iniquities. In other words, they're not going to get free. Now, that's under Old Testament. So let me, let me put this in perspective because any of us can go this direction. Take heed lest you fall. So one of the things we have to do is say, God, search my heart. Is there any place in me? That I have gone astray from the narrow way? Is there any place in me that I'm allowing the influence of the world to affect the way I minister, the truth that I'll speak, whether I'll speak at all? Or am I watering it down so I keep people in? I believe part of the great awakening that we're entering into is that we're going to be, a, be 
begin to see, and I believe we're already in the nation beginning to see this, people saying, I can't do that anymore. I can't sit under that anymore. I can't sit under the compromise anymore. The Lord told me probably 10, 12 years ago when he had me start CityGate. He said, I have called you to the lost and scattered sheep of the house of the Lord. And there's coming a day when those will come out of the aberrant denominations. Isn't that an interesting word? And they will be looking for a place that speaks truth. Causes me to tremble. But I'm determined that by God's grace, we will be one of those houses. And you notice the way I said that. I said one of those houses. Because there are many. We don't have an Elijah syndrome here. Refuse to have an Elijah syndrome. There's 7,000 out there that have not bowed their knee. But we need to know there are those who have gone the way of idolatry. And I don't say that in a gloating way. I'm praying God grant repentance. Because through Jesus Christ, as long as you've got breath and your heart has not completely hardened and only God knows that, that gift of repentance is available. So when I see somebody that's gone astray, I say, God, you know. Are they open to repentance? And that's not just saying, God, I'm sorry. That's God, change me. Let every piece of me be changed. And God, give us discerning hearts. And it goes on in verse 15. But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who took responsibility for my sanctuary, when the sons of Israel went astray from me, shall come near to minister and serve me. And they shall stand before me to offer the fat and the blood, declares the Lord. See, I want us to be sons and daughters, priests of the Most High God, like the sons of Zadok. Those whose hearts refuse to go astray. Those who say, God, I must have you or nothing. It's almost like a Patrick Henry kind of cry. Give me liberty or give me death. Give me Jesus. Give me a place of intimacy with you. Let me hear your voice. Let me see your face. Let me know your movements. Let me lead in such a way that it always points to Jesus. And it causes God's people to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Causes the people of God to say, the world around me is going mad with sin, but I'm going to walk straight. And see, they stand. And to stand is to take a position of covenant. It's to align yourself with heaven in alignment with covenant and say, I will not move out of this place of covenant with the Lord. God sent forth Jesus to walk on this dirty earth and to suffer and to be crucified and to be put in a tomb so that you and I could live. How do we dare go? Well, it's tough. I'll go along to get along. Really? See, God's telling us, take a stand. Stand. Stand firm. Now, you've got to understand, standing is what Jesus did when he walked through Israel, when he was born here and walked through. He took a stand when he stood in front of the religious leaders of the day, and said, you're whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. 
Now, in our modern day, they'd say, well, that's not very loving. Do you know that was the most loving thing he could say? And you're like, why did, what? No, it was the most loving thing because he called it what it was so that they had an opportunity to turn from the evil and go in the pathway of righteousness. It's time. It is time for us to speak truth in love. I see there was nothing about Jesus saying to them, you're whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. That was not unloving. Because he was the perfection of love. He is the perfection of love. And he said it because he said, if I don't say this to you, if I can use this phrase, bear with me, you're going to split hell wide open. I told a group of intercessors probably 20, 25 years ago, we were praying. I was no, no, it was 21 years ago. There was the gay pride parade was going on downtown and are about to go on the next weekend and they were praying about it and there were some in the room that were, you know, we need to go out there with the picket signs and the hateful stuff. And I just looked at him. I said, your heart's not right. This is a citywide gathering. I said, your heart's not right. And then there were others on the other side saying, we just need to love them and make them feel accepted. I'm like, your heart's not right. Bring those two together and your heart will be right. Because the most loving thing I can do to someone who is in sin is build a relationship with them so that I can point them to Jesus and speak the truth about the sin. But you can't go at somebody in sin with a pellet gun or worse. It doesn't work. And see, where it's got to start is right here in our heart. Do we love people enough? To have them reject us, spit on us, kick us, say all kinds of evil things about us. Are we willing to bring them the message of hope and love and have them tell us we're awful people? If I can be an awful person for Jesus, I'll be an awful person for Jesus. Does that make sense? See, we gotta, we've got to find our way into such a union with Christ that when we have to say some hard things, that love pours out first and in the middle and behind. All the way through. And people know love when they taste it. If you're just telling them the religious do's and don'ts, they're going to taste that, and it's pretty bitter. But it's, if the motivation is love, then you're going to speak truth, and then you're going to say, I'll help you walk through this. I'm not going to leave you where you are. I'll help you walk through it. I'll get you the help you need. I may not have the skill set to help you, but I can find somebody who does. And then Ezekiel 44, 23 and 24. It says, moreover, this is the priests, the sons of Zadok, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common and teach them to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. In a dispute, they shall take their stand, there's that word again, to judge. They shall judge it according to my ordinances they shall also keep my laws and my statutes in all my appointed feast and sanctify my Sabbaths. See, there's a call for sons of Zadok to stand. There's a call for sons of Zadok to minister to the Lord. He's our first and primary assignment. That's why when I walked in here tonight and I heard that sound, 
I knew it was going to totally take Randy off the song list. But I also know Randy and this team well enough to know that if God's doing something else, let's just go with it. And we're willing to do that because it's not about doing a song list. It's about ministering to the Lord. It's about moving with him. But I love this part of this passage. Let me say it, restate state that. I love it and tremble at it. Teach my people to discern. If there is something that I am seeing in the body of Christ right now is an abject lack of the ability to discern. Calling good evil and evil good. Hearing the voice of God then backing up and going, well, I, I, I didn't. See, we've got to learn how to discern by the Spirit. My heart grieves over the confusion, the division, the disputes, and the disgrace that it's causing the body of Christ. Because the world's watching us. The Lord spoke to me the other day about the intercession that we're doing over the nation. And there's been a lot of uh, comparisons to this season to Reese Howells. And I believe that is absolutely the truth. I believe God is moving us into a place of the authority in the spirit to be like Reese Howells was when they would go into what they called the Blue Room there at the Bible College in Wales. And they would pray and they would, God would give them a battle, a, a location of a battle ahead of time. They would pray, and there would be a victory. And the enemy would be defeated. And if you go read Reese Howell's book, Intercessor, it's written by Norman Grubb. If you read that book, what you see in the first part of that book is the journey of learning to walk in intercession. The journey of growing in maturity and discernment and trusting the voice of the Lord and doing what he said do to the point that you're willing to die to do what he says do. And one of the things the Lord said to me about this season where we're in, where we're beginning to operate at this level. Here I said beginning. Beginning is Reese Howells and his group was in the Blue Room at the Bible College of Wales without social media and without conference calls. All of the testimonies of what they did were written after the fact. We're doing this in real time. <laughs> and just like when you read the book on Intercessor, you realize they made some mistakes along the way. Guess what? We are too. We are too. And we're learning. It's called intense, in public, on the job training. Now, I read Reese's book, the book on Reese Howells, probably. When did it come out? In the 80s? Maybe early 90s? I read it when it came out. Studied it, prayed it, lived it. And so I'm recognizing this, that where many of us have done that personally, all of a sudden we're engaged in this thing publicly and corporately. And we're having to learn how to move as a corporate man. And there are still many people that don't understand the power of corporate intercession. They still want to go and pray in their corner, go into their closet, and there's a place. We all need to have that. Don't forsake that place, please. You can't do the corporate if you forsake the private. But when you get into that corporate place, 
There is a learning to listen to Holy Spirit and to discern what's going on and to follow those that have been appointed as leaders. And we Americans don't follow leaders real well. Now, I'm honored to be a part of these teams with Dutch and with Clay and all that because we do that. We follow each other, and we don't care who's leading. I mean, we just don't care. Whoever is the appointed leader, that's where we're going. And um, we listen for the sound of the anointing. Even when, like, if, like today when I led the 222 call, I'm listening for where is that sound? Where do, where do we go? Who goes next? Who's got that sound? And it's something just learning to do corporately. And a prayer call is an interesting place to do it. When we're all together, we do it different. But you're still listening for the sound. It's the sound of the anointing. But God is wanting to teach us discernment in a new way. One of the things we need to understand about discernment is it is rooted and can only be manifested out of intimacy with the Lord. It is that place of intimacy where you know his will, his word, and his ways. You will not have di true discernment in the kingdom without an intimate relationship with the Lord. You can't figure it out on your own. It's rooted in him. A primary key to growing in discernment is found in the prayer of Paul for the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Now may the grace and joyous favor of the Lord Jesus Christ, the unambiguous love, I love that, unambiguous love of God and the precious communion that we share in Holy Spirit be yours continually. That's the Passion Translation. See, a depth of relationship of intimately knowing Christ through communion with Holy Spirit and the foundation of the world, of the Word, is what brings forth discernment. Because it's your experiential relationship with Him that gives you the ability to rightly discern. You remember Solomon and his prayer from 1 Kings 3? Verse 9 says, so give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil, for who is capable of judging this great people of yours? Listen to the Amplified Version. So give your servant an understanding mind and a hearing heart with which to judge your people so that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge and rule this great people of yours? And the voice, just read part of it. Please give your servant a listening heart for judging your people and for knowing the difference between what is good and what is evil. See, discernment is rooted in having a hearing heart. The word in that place of hearing heart or an understanding mind and a hearing heart, or an understanding heart, is the word shama, S-H-A-M-A. -A. It is to hear, to listen to, with an intention to obey. In a Hebrew mindset, if you're listening to God, you're listening with your heart already tuned to say, God, whatever you say, I'll do. To listen without that is not shama. It's just listening, and it won't produce fruit. But when you tune your ear to hear his voice and say, God, whatever you say, I'm going to go with it. I'm going to do what you say do. And that word judge is shaphat, S-H-A-P-H-A-T. And it is to judge and to govern, to vindicate, to punish, to act as a lawgiver. Now, ecclesia, if we are to be operating as a legislative assembly, we need to know how to discern so that we might judge properly. If you can't discern, you're going to judge out of your flesh. I mean, there's things right now in the government I could judge out of my flesh. 
But I don't want to judge out of my flesh. I want to say, God, what are you saying right now? Because I don't want to do it in a way that's born out of my flesh because it will not produce righteousness. And the word discern in that passage is B-I-Y-N. It is to discern, to understand, to consider, to perceive, to give heed to, to distinguish. See, we've got to learn how to distinguish between some things. Because sometimes you can hear the right words, and if you're listening to Holy Spirit, you distinguish and discern it's not right. Y'all understand what I'm saying here? You can hear people say the right words. Let's heal the nation. It didn't take a real discerning heart to know that wasn't real. Because quite honestly, the only way they are looking to heal the nation is to shut us up. It's not going to happen. See, it's to be diligent and prudent. It's to separate. It's actually to be intelligent and to show oneself attentive. We have got to increase in our, in our attention. One of the things that we're guilty of as the body of Christ is that when an election is coming, everybody rallies because we want our God to win. I mean, come on. On every, on every spectrum. And then they get into office, and here's what some of elected officials who have gotten into office say. Y'all are praying for us, you're with us, and then when we get to D.C., it's like, where did y'all go? Because we slip back, and we go into status quo mediocrity. We go to tending to our own stuff. And we leave them in the swamp, righteous men and women, to try to maneuver through the garbage and the stench by themselves. Part of what God is saying right now to us is that you have got to learn how to stand on the wall and pray and fight in the spirit against unrighteous legislation. We've got to learn how to not shrink back just because we're not in an election. I mean, we've got to stop this mess. We've got to find some people, because some of us don't have the time, bandwidth, quite honestly, to follow all the legislation every week. But we have some people that are called to do that. That's what God's saying, I need you to be tracking what's going on. When I began to see the list of things that are getting passed and executive, or not even passed, they're just executive orders. This week, three days. We have got to rise up and learn how to stop it in the spirit. Which means, folks, we've got to have a keener ear of discerning of spirits. We've got to hear the strategies of the Lord. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see we're up against an antichrist system. It doesn't take a lot of discernment to see we've got wickedness in high places. Our discernment isn't there. That's in plain sight. The discernment has to be in God, what is your strategy? How are you telling us to pray? What are you telling us to do? How are we to move? Part of my question before the Lord for the last two to three months is, God, I need to know as a leader in this house with a voice with these others in the region and the nation, how do I help your people move forward in faith? To not lose hope, to not go off into the flesh, to be prudent, to be, what was the word we were talking about earlier? Shrewd. 
That's not a word the church has usually embraced, but it's a Bible word. And we need to be shrewd. We've got to be. But we have to discern where is Holy Spirit moving? And I keep hearing this phrase, don't fight a fight I'm not fighting yet. See, sometimes we see something that's kind of our pet peeve. Come on. And we start fighting on this, and God says, I'm not even dealing with that yet. Would you deal with what I'm dealing with? Where my passion is right now? Does God deal with the church? Bring us into the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. How can we have an influence into government if we can't even move this thing together on the Word of God? We can't. That word good, what is good, pleasant, and agreeable, it's valuable in estimation. speaks of prosperity and happiness, of benefit, and of moral goodness. The word bad means bad. But it also means evil, disagreeable, malignant, unpleasant, displeasing, worse than, worst, sad, unhappy, distressed, misery, injury, calamity, Adversity, that which is grievous. See, we need to be able to look at what's going on in our lives and around us and discern what's going to produce the fruit that is good and what's going to produce bad fruit. And, oh, by the way, it's the root that produces the fruit. We've gotten pretty good at picking off fruit, but we have not dealt with many roots yet. And God's going to teach us how to get there, but we have to grow in a discerning heart. I'm going to close with this. I will post some of this because um, I've got some scriptures on discernment that I will post out there. But I want to close with this because I'm seeing a lot of things out there, hearing a lot of people talk about, well, we need to pray for our president, for this new administration. I have a hard time even saying that. Jesus, help me. But listen, listen to me very, very carefully. If our prayers are going to be heard, we cannot ignore 1 Timothy 2. Verses 1 and 2. So the question becomes, how then do we pray for our governing rulers of our nation? I'm going to read 1 Timothy 1 and 2, 2. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Most of all, I'm writing to encourage you to pray with gratitude to God. We're not praying in gratitude for them. I want you to hear that because there's been some people saying it's not. Scripture says we pray in gratitude to God because he's God. He's sovereign. He's the one who rules and reigns. I am grateful because if we didn't have God, we'd be in a mess. Then it says pray for all men with all forms of prayers and requests as you intercede with intense passion. I want you to hear that. The intercession right now that we have to go into is not a, oh, God, please help us. We need to discern the strategy, and then we need to be passionate, and we need to be persistent, and we need to go for it night and day. Verse 2, and pray for every political leader and representative. I can hear the in the room. So that we would be able to live tranquil, undisturbed lives 
as we worship the awe-inspiring God with pure hearts. I see, we don't pray for them to succeed in their diabolical agendas. See, I've been seeing people say, we've got to pray and bless him. I'm going to bless him with the fear of God. I'm going to bless him to be stopped in the evil agenda that is antichrist. It's the best thing I can do. I'm going to pray that the evil agenda that is seeking to shut down pure worship in our nation would be overturned and brought to a stop. Yeah, I'm going to pray for our leaders. But I'm not going to pray for them to succeed in their diabolical schemes. This is a part of discernment. To pray for the failure of our government is stupid. But there are people who do. See, in, the, in all of our praying, we have to pray for our nation to fulfill purpose and destiny. In all of our praying, we have to pray for our government to line up with heaven so that the blessings of God are poured out on our land. But do you know what the key to that is? It's not the government. It's us. We're the barometer, and we're the thermostat. We set the temperature. We've had it set too cold. The weight and the fire of Holy Spirit has not been strong enough in the church. I want us to move into a time. Clay Nash actually had this word. And he would re, when we were talking earlier today, he shared it again. And it just, that there was coming a day when the government would fear our prayers like they feared the prayers of John Knox. Now, I know that there are some people that will rise to that individually. I believe Dutch Sheets is one of them. But I believe that's a corporate word for the ecclesia in this land. But we've got to have a higher level of discernment. We've got to have a purer heart. Our heart has got to be for the Lord. We cannot be guilty of being led astray by every wind of doctrine. We can't be led astray by what's the popular thing. We've got to be willing to lay it all on the line. For the sake of the kingdom of God, for the cause of Christ, for his honor and his glory, for our children, and our children's children. I was reading a bedtime story to my granddaughter last night. And it was on Deborah. And um, it was kind of taking, taking some liberties, literary liberties, but it was good. It was setting her into a place of being seen as a person that we could relate to, that a seven-year-old could relate to. And how God had made her bold. And one that would hear the voice of God and would do what he told her to do and would speak. About halfway through the book, she looked at me and she says, like you, Grandma.
And I said, and like you. And like you. You see, I'm of the age that I grew up. We prayed together in school. We all went to church together. It was unusual for somebody not to go to church somewhere. Four-letter words were not allowed on the radio. Perversion was not allowed to be seen on TV or in a movie. There was a standard of righteousness even among the ones that didn't know God. Because there was a restraining force in the land by the holiness of the church. And over the years, to be culturally relevant, we let some of those things slide. We let dishonor come into the house of God. We became too familiar with leaders. And this is rooted in us becoming too familiar with God. And I don't mean familiar as in intimacy. I mean familiar with, hey, Papa. And I don't mean that in a dishonor because he is my Papa. But there was this, this losing of the awe and reverence of the God who created all the universe is still the God who walks with me and allows me to come and snuggle up next to him when my heart is breaking. But he's still the God who rules and reigns on high. He's the God who's holy. And he's the God who says, if you'll come to me, I will take your pain. I'll take your hurt. I'll take your disappointments. I'll take your fears, your doubts, your unbeliefs, and your disbeliefs. And I will heal you. I'll deliver you. And I will make you who I created you to be. Because here's the real deal, folks. The happiest you'll ever be in this land, on this earth, is being who God created you to be. Not being what you think you ought to be. Not operating in a gifting that you think you would like. See, I told God I wouldn't do this. I said, I'll do anything but speak in front of people. <laughs> be careful what you tell God you won't do. But I came to a place where I said, God, whatever you want me to do, wherever you tell me to go, I'll do it. And I couldn't be happier. I'm more me than I've ever been. And I still know there's more to discover. That's my heart cry for us, for all of us. And I want to charge you as I stand as one of God's, like you do, that you pray for those in authority, but you do it the Bible way. Pray that evil agendas fall to the ground and pray that righteousness, justice, and truth will flow through the streets like a river. That salvation will come even into the capital. Please, Jesus. And that our capital, do you know this? I just was reminded of this. It just, Holy Spirit bubbled it. 
Did you know that our capital used to house the largest mega church in the nation? Mm -hmm. In the early days. God returned the capital to mega church status. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Would you stand with me? Lord, I thank you for such a great salvation. I thank you, Lord, for such great hope that you are the God of all hope. And I thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be prisoners of hope. And that no matter what goes on around us, are even the things that come up near us and even touch us. Lord, we will not shrink back. And the Holy Spirit told me to, re to tell y'all something I forgot. When Paul wrote to Timothy that passage, he was writing to Timothy at Lystra. Now you go, why are you telling me that? or Lystra, I think it's pronounced. The reason is, that is the city where Paul was stoned to death and resurrected. So it is into that atmosphere of danger and political opposition that Paul said to Timothy, pray for all your rulers. That's significant. I didn't know that until earlier. And the Lord said, I want you to look this up. I want you to look this up. What was the atmosphere that I sent that word to? It was an atmosphere of violence. It was an atmosphere of opposition. It was an atmosphere of danger to the people of God. But it was also an atmosphere into which resurrection power came. And Paul was raised and Timothy became a disciple. So God, in this place, in an atmosphere that is anti-Christ, anti-church, anti-kingdom, we say, God, we're going to obey your word. We are going to flee from every appearance of evil. We will bless those that persecute us, and we're going to bless them with your word. We're going to bless them with a, an encounter with Holy Spirit, with a revelation of Jesus. Because, Lord, the best blessing we can give anybody is that they know you. Lord, we're going to bless our land to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. We're going to bless our governmental leaders with the fear of the Lord, with wisdom and understanding, knowledge and might, counsel. And the spirit of the living God, we're going to bless our land with truth, with righteousness, and with justice. And we're going to pray, God, that you will do whatever is necessary so that your people and the people of this land may live a quiet and tranquil life. Free to worship, our God, honestly, free to not worship. Because freedom is not in mandating that someone worship, but giving the choice. And so, Lord, I am beseeching you with passion and saying, God, do whatever you must do. So that your church rises up as a shining light to display your glory. That the harvest of thousands will come into the kingdom. And peace and tranquility would be our portion in this land. And Lord, according to the prophetic word, 
a decree over the United States of America. America shall be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pray, folks. Keep praying. Keep standing. Ask Holy Spirit how, and then obey. I bless you all. Good night.